Welcome to Bible study. We're studying John, and this is the Bible study intended for Sunday, September 25. If you've been watching these uh, until this point, and I encourage you to maybe go back and re watch some of the earlier ones if you haven't, we're looking at the Gospel according to St. John. And we went through the prologue, and the prologue actually spends quite a bit of time talking about the ministry of John the Baptist. Not the author of this gospel, a different John, which is a very common name in the ancient world, as it is today. And he called John a witness. A witness who bears testimony to Jesus. Now, as we've asserted already, we think that's an important thing for him to say, because we think there's a John movement out there. We think there's some people who are still following John and wondering if he wasn't the, the prophet or the Messiah that uh, God had promised. And so we believe John is actually speaking to them when he does this, and he's speaking to his own readers to be able to say uh, that, that John bore witness to this guy. So we want to pay particular attention when we study John to what it is that John the Baptist says. Because anytime you have a witness, that witness bears a testimony. And you, as the hearer, need to listen to the testimony. For remember John's goal in this whole book, we read that last week, we looked at that, it is that you would faith, that you would believe. Remember, English is missing that word. It's a much stronger word than believe. It means to trust wholly to something. And that you would faith in Jesus, in his name, and that by faithing, you would have life. That that is the conduit by which life comes to us. So this is the goal of the entire book of John. He wants you to faith, to believe in Jesus. And he's got a very specific Jesus in mind. And that's what he's really after. Because apparently there were some people maybe who were faithing in a different sort of Jesus. But now we have to talk about John's testimony. And we want to be really clear about what it is. We start in verse 29 of the first chapter. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's the promise. Jesus is the Lamb who takes away not just your sin, my sin, but the sin of the whole world. John is writing this, uh, and John the Baptist is speaking this in a particular context, and we probably need to pay a little bit of attention to that context before we go any farther. Um, being Christians, we pretty much understand what a lamb is, uh, and particularly in the biblical context with the Old Testament sacrificial system. But I'm not sure we quite get what it is that they did with these lambs. If you go back into the book of Leviticus, for instance, and you'll come in chapter 7 and there following thereupon, in chapter 12 especially, the sin offerings that the people of God were supposed to make in the Old Testament. They were for a variety of reasons. Um, I think that what has happened to us in the in the uh, uh, contemporary world, is that the word sin, first of all, hardly ever gets used anymore. We don't talk about sins anywhere. The, the only place that we really see perhaps sin in the, in the world outside of a church or religious conversation will be on a dessert menu. It's almost become kind of something we laugh about. You know, the, the, the triple chocolate cake is sinfully good. But even that, I found, is kind of diminishing. The word is almost falling out of our vocabulary. Um, but other words are taking its place. And maybe we need to think about how, what words those might be. For in the, um, uh, in the Old Testament, sin was a very broad term. It covered a lot of different things. Not just being naughty. 
which is usually what we think of, that you've done something that was morally suspect or wrong. But no, in the Old Testament, you made a sin offering after you gave birth to a child. You made a sin offering when you harvested your wheat. You made a sin offering uh, when you recovered from any kind of skin disease. So, I mean, if you had a chicken pox or a, or a, uh, uh, you know, a, a fungus, you know, like an athlete's foot or a ringworm or something like that, when you got over it, you were to make a sin offering. You made a sin offering if you came into contact with a dead body. And you even made a sin offering if you had mildew in your house. Now, none of those things are particularly moral or immoral. It wasn't just some women who gave birth to a child who had to make a sin offering. It was all women. And the point of it was not that there was something naughty or bad about making or giving birth to a child. But I think if you go back to Genesis 3, you learn that it wasn't supposed to hurt so much. And there's nothing wrong or immoral about harvesting your wheat. But as God had told Adam, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your bread. It wasn't supposed to be so much hard work. even something like touching a dead body. Well, again, Genesis 3, you shall return to the dust, for dust you are. For, from dust you came, and to dust you shall return. And it seems like every time we encounter one of these sort of dramatic moments where we are reminded of the fall into sin, we're reminded of the brokenness of this world, and of the fact that our humanity has been fundamentally disfigured by, by what has happened. God would say to the people of Israel long ago, take a lamb, a one-year-old male lamb, or by the way, a male goat, bring it to the temple, sacrifice the lamb. And this meant slaughtering the lamb. Um, but they didn't burn the whole thing. They shared it with the priest and they ate it. And this was the idea of when you slaughter a lamb, this is what you do. But every one of those lambs was really pointing ahead to Jesus. That's the point that John the Baptist is making today. That Jesus is the lamb who takes away not just the moral guilt. He certainly does that. That was another reason why you should make a sin offering in the ancient world. But because when you've just buried your dead loved one. And remember, there's no funeral home industry. You came into contact with the dead body. When you've just buried your dead loved one, your father, your mother, your grandmother, whatever, Jesus said, bring a lamb. Or God said, bring a lamb. Let me show you what I'm going to do about that. What I'm going to, what my answer to the death of your loved one is. What my answer to your exhaustion is. What my answer to your pain is. Bring a lamb. I'll show you how I'm going to solve that problem. And now what John the Baptist is testifying with these words is, this is the solution that takes away the pain, the exhaustion, the sickness, the suffering, the death of the whole world. As you get ready to think about it, maybe come and talk about this on Sunday, or as you're thinking about this, imagine what words besides sin might we use today? What would be the kind of ways that we would talk about this now? That Jesus Christ fixes all the genetic um, code miswrites that we have in our DNA that create the problems that so many of us face physically. That Jesus Christ is the one who repairs the climate. Uh, that, that has gone so awry. That Jesus Christ is the answer to our, what? COVID. To our susceptibility to the diseases and the, and the, and the problems of life. And, and ultimately that Jesus Christ is the one who raises the dead. Because you see, after John makes this 
statement about Jesus, we know from the Gospels that what Jesus does is he goes out and starts solving all these kinds of problems. He, he, he opens the eyes of the blind, he opens the ears of the deaf, he cleanses lepers, he, he raises dead people, he casts out demons, he does it all. He even calms the storms, the multitudes eat, and nobody's brow got sweaty that day. They just ate because he is the Lamb of God who takes away all the brokenness, all the sin of the world. John goes on, and let's see a little more, listen to a little more of what he says. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. So John is saying, Jesus is ahead of me. He is more important than I am because he was before me. And here now John is saying something about Jesus' nature. Jesus is not simply another man born because remember from the Lucan account, John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. That's why we celebrate the birth of John the Baptist on the 24th of June, not the 25th. Just your little bit of liturgical um, trivia here. Uh, liturgical dates are always counted from the end of the month. The 25th is six days before the first day of January. And so the same day in June would be the 24th because unlike December, June only has 30 days. I know it's really weird, but it's the way the calendars used to count. And the liturgical calendar still counts that way. So we're asserting here, so John is making a testimony that Jesus is actually older than him. Even though we know that the birth of Jesus was later. And the point that he's making is that Jesus is actually from an eternity. As John just said, he was with God in the beginning. I myself did not know him. But for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. In other words, that John's purpose was to reveal Jesus. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize, that would be God, with water, said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen, and I have borne witness, that this is the Son of God. So John has gone on to say a couple of really important things right here, hasn't he? That we need to pay attention to. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is from eternity. Well, he hasn't really said that, but at least he says he's earlier than I am. Right? And this is he who has the Holy Spirit. John baptizes with water. It's just water. But when Jesus baptizes, it is with the Holy Spirit. And he's able to do that, says John, because I saw the Holy Spirit of God descend upon him. He has that resource to give. He has that, that thing resident here so that he can share it with someone else. Now, of course, we know that a lamb in the ancient world uh, had really one purpose in the Jewish faith. It was this thing to be sacrificed. I'm standing here today in front of the cross. John already wants us to see who this Jesus is and where it is that he's going. He says he is a lamb. A lamb who takes away the sin of the world. The lambs who took away sins. The lambs of the, of the Old Testament sacrificial system were lambs that were sacrificed. They were killed. And John is very clear that this is where we're going with this. That this is what is going to happen here. 
We're going to listen a little bit more to what, uh, to what um, uh, Jesus has to say, or what John has to say. Um, the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. He looked at Jesus as he walked by, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said, What are you seeking? What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? But that question that Jesus asked them, I think is really a question addressed to us. What is it you're looking for? What does your heart desire? It's a really important question Jesus asked them. He said to them, come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and who followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah. We found the guy. How can he know that? He just listened to John. Behold the Lamb of God, he said. He was there when he pointed out, this is he of whom the one who sent me said, the one on whom you see the Holy Spirit descend, that's him, the Son of God. He's believing, Andrew is believing what John said. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, so you are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, the rock. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. In other words, these guys, are, they're, they're, they're making this immediate claim and this immediate um, promise to the person that they're talking to. We found the Messiah, the person that Moses was talking about when he promised a Messiah. When he said that the son of Adam and Eve would crush Satan's head. He says, we found the guy. This is him. Nathaniel retorted, can anything good come out of Nazareth? How we get this other thread that Jesus or that John wants to weave into this book, and that is that Jesus didn't glow in the dark. Jesus did not appear to be anything other than a man, because guess what? Jesus was, is, a man. He doesn't look or appear to our human senses as something particularly divine. He looks very normal. Can anything good come out of that Nowhereville, Nazareth? We have gone digging up around in Nazareth in archaeological digs and discovered there's not a lot there. It was a tiny little village, a very poor place. The houses were tiny, and the people lived very poor lives. Jesus was a very normal, he was in this sort of sea of humanity that, that existed in the ancient Roman Empire, of the nameless, faceless mass of people. He was one of them. Philip simply said to him, come and see. I'm going to show him to you. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. I wonder if Jesus didn't say that somewhat ironically. <laughs> because Nathanael has already been somewhat cynical. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him before Philip called you. When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi. And he realizes that Jesus knows more. This unassuming guy from Nazareth knows way more than he should. Rabbi. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. 
And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That quote is loaded with meaning for a Jewish person of the time because that comes from Daniel and it is a quote of a vision that Daniel had in which he saw the Messiah and that's exactly how he described him as the Son of Man with angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That, that's like a code word for people who live at the time and for anybody who continues to read the whole of the Bible and understand the whole of the text as a biblical Christian should they hear that and they hear this resonance. In Jesus' trial, when he repeats this word, this very quote from Daniel, it will be enough that the high priest will tear his clothes and they say, we have no need of a witness to bear witness against him. He is born in himself. He believes himself to be the Messiah, the Son of God. So we have to kill him is what's their response. Jesus made no hide, did not hide who he was. He made it from the very beginning and said, I am that guy. That guy Daniel saw. That guy Moses saw. That guy John the Baptist saw. You hear that? You hear the, the sort of the, the hammer blows of what John is telling us about Jesus. And he's using John the Baptist and the disciples and others to bear this witness to who this Jesus is so that you can believe it. We'll talk more about this in a little bit. Uh, we pray, pray that these words have been good for you. God bless you. Have a great week.